Hello, beautiful listeners. Before we get started with this week's episode, I want to take some time to make sure that you know that there is a trigger warning attached to it. I will be talking somewhat in depth about my struggles through mental health, through unhealthy relationship dynamics, and with substance abuse. So listener discretion is lovingly advised. You're listening to the Spiritual Banks Podcast. You guys, it's Thursday. That means it's a new episode of the Spiritual Banks Podcast. I absolutely don't do it as well as Chris. I just don't. You know why? Because only Chris can do that voice. Hi guys, Um, it's me, Nicole, your host for today, and oh my gosh, this is episode four. It's crazy because um, this little idea is slowly growing into having listeners, and I am feeling super blessed um, and excited about it, so thank you guys for sharing, for uh, taking time to listen, for liking things, giving it to your friends, giving feedback. That one's important. We enjoy that one. Um, So yeah, thank you for that. I just want to say thank you. I am filled with joy. Uh, Right. So when I was brainstorming topics for this season, one of the topics that kind of kept coming back around to me was um, this idea of hustle culture. And for those of you that are not familiar, just take a little moment to tell you that Hustle culture is kind of like this glorified mentality of achieving. Um, If you want it, simply work harder. If you want it, wake up earlier. Uh, If you want it, grind harder, essentially. And once you have it, go get more of it. Just reach for more. Um, Also, just side note, I want to make it really clear that today's episode isn't condemning the mindset of working harder to achieve your dreams. I absolutely support that. That is absolutely necessary. Um, Today's episode is me sharing my experience with hustle culture and how it affected every area of my being, but not in the way that you read about, not in the way that self-help books talk about. Um, And I actually feel like my experience with it may be more of a norm than it is the exception to the rule. Uh, And for that reason, I felt really led um, and pulled to share this portion of my life with you. Um, So the ideas around hustle culture are not innately wrong. If you want something, essentially put in the work to achieve it to the best of your ability, right? That's how you knock out a goal. That's how you commit to a workout program. That's how you save money for a house. That's how you uh, write a book. Um, It's great. It's great on a project to project basis. However, there is a toxicity that lies just below the surface. Um, As I share this, my honest hope and prayer is that you guys will be inspired by it, that it'll be helpful um, or useful to you, that if there is a part of yourself reflected back in my sharing of this portion of my life, that you'll stare straight into it and you'll do the work to heal it. I have reworked this episode and spent time into not making this a tell-all about my past relationship um, and about drama. The details I am about to share are necessary in order to convey mindset, um, so my mental and emotional and spiritual state at that time in my life, and where it all slid downhill. In November of 2018, I don't know the exact day, (laughs) Um, I do know that it was around 1 a.m., I was laying on my sofa. And my three children and partner at the time were completely asleep, and I could not sleep. And that was not unusual. Um, I had a shoulder that kept dislocating, 
causing a lot of pain. So when I rolled over, sometimes it would dislocate. Um, but I was generally just in chronic pain. And I was waiting on the surgery for that. Um, so I'm laying on the couch and I am scrolling as people scroll on their phones when they can't sleep. Um, and I just had this horrible heaviness. Um, like my life was falling apart and I often felt that way during this time. Um, I was trying to manage moderate anxiety and depression. Um, and uh, I was trying to do it without the tools that I needed for various reasons. Um, the partnership I was in often experienced dramatic waves, not the normal waves that being with someone can create, but the big ones of are we together or are we not? Are we going to stay together? Is this a healthy relationship for me to be in? Um, there was just a lot of instability, and it was a massive cycle in our relationship. And it usually looked something like this. My partner would think that I wasn't doing enough, being enough, or good enough for him. He would make this known. It would start a fight. And despite me feeling as though I had grown as a communicator, um, it always resulted in hurtful words pushing me to a place of emotionally snapping and then he would threaten to leave if I didn't get my shit together. I would cuss a lot, I would cry a lot, um, and then I would beg him to stay, and I would promise that I would be, or do, or become a better version of myself, um, and he would agree to stay, and I would have to prove myself. And when I say that this happened a lot in our relationship, it's because it's hard for me to quantify just how many times we would go through this cycle. Hearing things like, you're a bad mom, you're an unproductive member of society, you're a bad partner. After enough times, that became my personal truth. And that's a personal truth I am still working on healing to this day. Him threatening to leave regularly became the instability that I was trying to raise our family on. So that kind of paints a picture of the vulnerability and the fragility that existed in my life that I hid during that time. So <laughs> I'm laying on the sofa scrolling that night and I come across this video of a woman that you may have heard of and her name is Rachel Hollis. And I am immediately sucked into the world of Rachel Hollis and I am excited and I start listening to her podcast um, and she is speaking straight to my heart, and she's talking about reaching for more, pushing yourself harder, making sacrifices, and taking control of your life, and I literally go, this is the answer. This is the motivation I need. This is all of the words that I need. Um, this is it. Um, and even more, she also at the time had a podcast with her then husband about how to take control of your relationship and make it amazing. So there was this healing component um, there that I so desperately, and I mean desperately, needed in my life during that time. She also had this journal, I think she still does, called the Start Today Journal, in which she incorporates gratitude, um, and you guys know Gratitude practice is straight up my spiritual alley. So I, <laughs> by 5 a.m., had ordered the journal, had listened to multiple podcasts, and I was fucking ready to take on the world. I'm going to fix myself again, and I'm going to fix my relationship and make it amazing. The advice they give are all, all of it's essentially really helpful things to incorporate in your life. Wake up earlier, work on something close to your heart, drink more water, dream, aspire, and then be that thing. And once you've accomplished that thing, accomplish more. Accomplish as much as you possibly can because that, well, that's your legacy. And I shit you not, that spoke to my heart, to my soul. 
So we move forward into December of 2018. I think around the 18th is actually when I had finally had my, my shoulder surgery. Um, and if you've never had shoulder surgery before, it is um, painful. <laughs> Uh, and the type that I had was them tightening the capsule of my shoulder and anchoring it in so it would no longer slip out of place. Um, and it's a long recovery. And it knocked me on my butt. Um, I was sleeping in a recliner. I was on strong pain medicine and muscle relaxers. And I couldn't, of course, use my arm because it's in a sling. And gosh, how old would Skylar have been? He would have been two years old. Skylar's my youngest, if you don't know, and um, so so a handful. Um, so it's been a week, and my partner is doing a good job of taking care of me. Uh, you know, he thankfully enlisted his mom um, to help take care of the kids when we needed it. Um, I think she made us some meals. He's tending to me when he's not at work. Uh, but I know that before too long, because this is the cycle, or was the cycle of us, um, he's going to get upset and he's going to begin to treat me differently. He's going to get a little bit meaner with every day and he's going to have a little less patience with every day. And so I'm a week post-op and I am more stressed that I'm taking too long to recover than I am focused on the fact that I need to be healing and that this is a long recovery process. Again, I'm only telling you this part so that you understand my frame of mind at the time. <clears throat> we get to Christmas, and I honestly remember being miserable. Um, we were at his mom's house, well, his mom and dad's house, with all the family, and it's always kind of a stressful time. It was always something that um, the build-up to was stressful. Um, there was always lots of drinking in that household. Um, so I'm drinking, I'm on pain, man, uh, pain medicine. Just a side note, don't ever do that. It's really dangerous. Um, I've put on weight, which matters in this relationship because depending on my size, I knew that I'd either be more accepted or less accepted, loved or pushed away, and I was a wreck. I was a wreck. So 2019 comes, um, and I asked my partner to go see this Rachel Hollis documentary that is only going to be playing in theaters for a limited time. I don't know if anybody who followed um, or follows Rachel Hollis remembers um, that she put out that big documentary. It's on Amazon now. You can watch it. But um, anyways, uh, much to my delight, <laughs> he agrees. And so we go. And I wanted to share it with him, this thing that I had found. I was really excited to have him go with me. Um, and I was even more excited when he's on board with this new way of looking at things. And I can remember sending him the Rise Together podcast, which um, I think has a completely different drive to it now. But in 2018, 2019, it was a marriage podcast. It was a how to repair your marriage podcast, like how to keep it alive. Um, and so I don't know if he actually listened to the episodes. I think maybe a few of them I know for sure he did. That does not matter. <laughs> um, so I get my journal. I do my journal. I set my goals. But I am still struggling hardcore. Nothing in myself or my relationship has specifically changed. Um, other than, you know, I'm working through uh, physical therapy for my arm, which helps me. Uh, be able to be more present for my family physically. So I'm doing my best and taking care of our family. Um, I'm working, um, doing sessions and teaching classes and things like that, uh, taking care of the household, uh, my financial obligations. But I know that it's never going to be quite enough. Even when the reality of it is that what I'm doing is enough, I am so conditioned at this point to believe that it's not, and I can't relax. And I don't know if you've ever been in a season of your life in which you are constantly in fight or flight, but you are miserable. Your body hurts. There's too much cortisone in your body. 
Um, and it makes it really difficult. You're just on, you're on edge. Um, so I'm going through physical therapy, like trying to recover, and I'm downgraded in my pain management to tramadol, which um, is a narcotic. Um, it's perfect because to me, tramadol is this wonder drug. It's an upper, uh, for me anyway. It's how it reacts in my system is it's definitely an upper. Um, it would be like if you gave me Adderall. I can magically get things done. Um, and I know this, and I'm familiar with it, because it's a pain pill that was taken for everything in our house. If my partner was stressed, he took Tramadol. If I was anxious, he took Tramadol. If we were going to go to the lake and drink and party, Tramadol. If we were going to go on a date night, which also included drinking, Tramadol. Um, and it's interesting because I never did these things like drinking and popping Tramadol uh, before this relationship. I think... Um, you know, I did have an experience when I was divorcing my, um, first husband. I was really young. I was about 25 and we were going through a divorce and I had a binge drinking experience. And outside of that, I didn't really drink. Um, and when I say a experience or an, an experience, it was an experience. It was one time that it happened. And I stopped drinking like that. Um, but I think because it was something that was so frequently done in my partner's family and with his group of friends, um, I went from a one and done kind of gal to trying to keep up with someone bigger than I was. And that's dangerous. Um, anyway. The point of that is that we drink often, and tramadol was often a part of that. Um, I do want to say that I had no idea when I started taking tramadol that it was actually a narcotic. I was told that it wasn't and that it was not addictive. And while I accept full responsibility for taking it, I also believed the person who told and gave it to me. And I chose to stay blind to that even after noticing that I would need more and more to get that desired high from it. What made it even harder is that it was readily supplied to our household, and now in this timeline, I have my own prescription. I knew I would be able to push myself harder and get more done, and that was exciting to me. And what started out as me taking um, this medication as prescribed turned into a four to five pills a day habit. And if I ran out, I knew just who to call to get more. And then I became really good at learning how to hide how much I was using. And by April of 2019, I knew I was in, a, I was in trouble. I was in a really bad place. And so I attempted to go off of it. I told my partner. Uh, I went through withdrawals. And it's awful. It makes you feel like your skin is crawling. Um, you can't get comfortable. Your mind races. Your anxiety is high. You feel like it is the end of the world. Um, so I definitely had breakdowns. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was looked at in the way of, I can't believe you're addicted to this rather than it being anything else. Despite the reality of it all, that I had gotten this drug from him and I was told it was fine, what was being displayed to me on his end was almost this complete disgust that I couldn't handle it. And I held so much shame, so much guilt for not being able to control myself with this drug. I held so much guilt for the mental breakdowns that would happen when we would take it and I would binge drink. I would literally black out. And I knew that it had to stop. 
And so I decided in April, I believe it was before my birthday of that year, that I was going to get clean from it. And it put me back in this position of having to prove that once again in our relationship that I was worthy of being loved. That I would work harder and then he would see that I was lovable. I need to pause for a moment and share the fact that this wasn't the only abusive relationship that I've ever been in, and it was not by far the worst. Every relationship I had been in did, however, attract me to this specific partner who echoed a truth that I had come to believe, that I was unworthy of being loved the way that I was, and that love was something that had to be painfully earned. This is important for you guys to know because it was the subconscious mentality I tackled my life with. I stayed away from tramadol until about June of that year. Um, so June of 2019, so a few months. And then I was right back on it. And the guilt set in, but I couldn't break the habit. Um, and this is all building up to kind of a life-changing weekend that we'll dive into right after this break. Hey. Hey, did you guys know that we have a newsletter? Well, we do. If you want to stay up to date about the latest episodes, anything going on with Chris and I that we feel we want to share with you guys, or how you can help support the Spiritual Banks podcast, we invite you to visit www.spiritualbanks.com to sign up. My neighbor just started weed-eating his lawn, so I've switched to a different mic in hopes that you can't hear it. Fingers crossed. Um, let's get back to the topic at hand. So in 2019, July of 2019, um, I'm standing in my kitchen, and I am I'm super, super depressed. Um, I'm the heaviest I've ever been. In my life up until this point in multiple ways, emotionally, um, just a sad person, um, the heaviest weight wise. Uh, and uh, I have, I'm someone who has several different journals, all with a different purpose. And so I had spent that specific morning journaling. Um, and what I was journaling was coming straight from the uh, core of my soul. And I was journaling to the universe that I was sick, that I was tired, and that I was so ready to surrender to change. And when I looked back at this journal entry to kind of refresh my memory about this time period for today's episode, in bold letters and marker, I wrote, God, just send me change. And I am reminded of that place. Um, and I'm not kidding when I say two minutes later, my lifelong friend Kayla texts me. Now, Kayla and I have been friends since we were like nine or ten. We went to church together and then we just decided to follow each other all over the state of Oklahoma. So <laughs> we both ended up um, in the same apartment complex unknowingly. Um, uh, in Stillwater, and then uh, I can't remember who moved to Tulsa first. I want to say it was probably me, but I'm uncertain. Anyways, she moved to Tulsa shortly after. Um, so we've just kind of like followed each other in life, but she um, is also a beach body coach, and she's a damn good one. And um, anyway, she, she texts me, and she said, uh, I have an extra ticket to the beach body conference. I know how much you love Rachel Hollis. She's the keynote. Do you want to come? And at this point, I'm like literally picking my jaw up off the floor. I'm like, do I want to come for Rachel Hollis? Yes. To work out? Fucking no. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the very next thing I do is think of every reason not to go. Like every reason possible. It was a few days before uh, my youngest son's birthday. 
um, and he was set to have a birthday party that weekend. And I had never, ever missed one of my children's birthdays up until that point, ever. In fact, I am one of those moms that plans every single tiny detail. And um, it is, I just love planning their birthday parties. I've just always been that way. Anyways, um, you know, the fact that it was in Indianapolis um, and we were in Tulsa, I knew that we were in for a very long drive. Um, I knew that it would cost money that I didn't necessarily have. Um, it would cause my partner to have to take care of everything, including the birthday party and the three kids. Um, and he had never done that. Um, and then I started shaming myself. I'm too fat to go. I'm too fat to be seen at a beach body con conference. Um, I've never worked out a day in my life. Outside of that one time, I tried CrossFit and almost died. Um, I don't use Beachbody. I'm not a Beachbody coach. I just started thinking of every single reason as to why I shouldn't go. And a beautiful gift that my partner gave me was permission to go, was motivation to go. He came home. He uh, helped me pack my bags. He said, my mom will take care of the party and help me take care of the kids. You go ahead and you go. And so in a matter of, I think it was like two hours, um, I was in a car with women I didn't know outside of Kayla, which if you know me, I'm a, I have a little bit of social anxiety. Um, and so that was a new experience. And I was super worried I was going to be judged but I wasn't. Um, anyway, so we were headed to Indianapolis uh, for one of the most life-changing weekends. Um, it was life-changing for several reasons, you guys. Um, and I don't think any of it had to do with Rachel Hollis's keynote, even though it was, it was good. Um, it was life-changing because I had just spent that morning crying genuine tears into my journal of surrender of telling the universe that I could not do it on my own anymore and to please save me from myself. It was life-changing uh, because for the first time in my life, I had a group of women take me in and see me and they still chose to love and support me and they still do to this day. And I'm super grateful. Thank you, ladies, if you're listening. <laughs> um, for the first time in my life, I broke an addiction to something that had me in its grip. And I have no doubt that if I had continued on the way that I was going with tramadol and uh, heavy drinking, um, that I would have combined the two one too many times and it would have been um, a catastrophe for everyone. Um, I am really proud to say that I have not struggled with tramadol nor any substance from that moment forward, from that weekend forward. Uh, it was life-changing because I pushed myself that weekend. I did work out. I did it. I worked out, you guys. <laughs> I may have felt like I was going to die, uh, but I had this moment when we were in the streets of Indianapolis downtown and there are like 1,800 people there. No, that's not a big number. I just lied to you. There were 18,000 people there. Um, forgive me. 18,000 people there working out in the streets of downtown Indianapolis, and I was one of them. And I would have never had put, never have put myself there by myself. Um, and it was life-changing because I proved to myself that I could keep going despite discomfort. And that ended up being... A double-edged sword because if you know me I go bigger I go home I go harder I go home that used to be my motto anyways I'm in a very loving marriage that has taught me that rest is so fucking important and that I am loved even when I need to rest so anyways um, I came home from that weekend completely changed. I signed up not only to use Beachbody, but to become a Beachbody coach myself. And I lost 20 pounds. 
And I started working out every single day. And the more praise that I got from my partner, the more I resented him. Because I, I could not help but see through the lens of you didn't love me before. I wasn't good enough before. And now I am. I was so angry, you guys. And so um, I actually... I actually broke up with him. Um, And we would end up getting back together before the end of the year because there was a part of me that still loved him, absolutely. Um, We had children together. We had created a life. We were together for six years. Um, Well, I guess a little less than six years at that point. Um... So we got back together and I kept on working on self-development. I was still in this hustle culture mentality and it bled into every single aspect of my life. I was up at 5 a.m. every morning. I would work out. It was great. I actually really enjoy it. Um, From there, I would sit down and I would pour my heart into a book that I would never end up publishing. I finished it but I would never end up publishing. Um, I couldn't. This book uh, was a book about rewriting the narrative of trauma and healing yourself. And I knew I couldn't publish it just due to the fact that despite being back together with my partner, not a lot had changed. We were still in this cycle of me not being good enough, him not being happy with me. Um me having to prove my worth over and over and over again. Um, And so within a month or two, the pattern of him wanting to leave and me begging him to stay um, started again. It hit again. And I couldn't publish a book that I couldn't currently apply to my life. Um, And I had this massive wound. And so I couldn't, I couldn't put it out there into the world that I was in this healthy, balanced relationship when I knew that I was not. When I knew that despite, it's hard to talk about. Despite working my ass off in every way possible, I was screaming inside. I was screaming. Because it still wasn't enough. He came to me, I think it was about a year later. Ooh, need a moment to compose myself. (laughs) Um, he came to me nearly a year after we had gotten back together um, to tell me that he had been lying to me for the entirety of our relationship. So six years. From the moment he met me, he had been lying to me. And the lie itself was a big one, but the fact that he was able to hide it from me All of those years, lie straight to my face about it. That was bigger. That was bigger. And I remember when he told me I couldn't even process it. And I could tell that he was remorseful. And I began to become really aware of the fact that he had just unloaded something that he had been carrying for so long. And my first reaction was to make sure that he was okay. And make sure that he didn't regret telling me something that he had been carrying that had obviously been weighing on him. And... I didn't want him to feel like a bad person. It's 
it's getting real, you guys. <laughs> I didn't want him to feel like a bad person, so I swallowed it. And I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like that. But it's hard. And we had been through so much together. And so I owed him, I felt, I felt that I owed him and so I swallowed it down and I tried to move forward. But the truth was that for over a year, I had been pushing myself further into becoming a better person. Not compared to anyone, but myself. Better than I had been before. Further into doing it all, being it all, achieving whatever was in front of me. And I partly did it for myself, but I did it a lot for him. To show him that I could do it, if that's what it took to be loved by him. If that would make him love me and want me, I was capable of moving mountains. I took a method used for achieving goals and I made it my entire life and I ignored, ignored anything to the contrary because there was a narrative in mainstream culture telling me that it was on me to fix and maintain every aspect of my life. From what time I woke up in the morning to if my partner loved me or not. And it had all brought me to this moment of finding out that the person I thought I was with, I wasn't actually with. I didn't actually know who he was. More after this break. You found yourself listening to the Spiritual Banks Podcast with your host, Nicole Banks. Thanks for hanging in there with me, you guys. So, um, all of the stress and all of the pressure of trying to make life work after he told me that September, um, it, it fell down around me, honestly. And, um, in November of 2020, I can't remember what night it was. That's okay. Actually, I do. Actually, I do. It was the 3rd of November. Um, I was making dinner for my family, and I was still drinking at this point. Um, um, I had taken a step back from drinking as much I would do from the Beach Body Conference until um, September like the end of September of, of uh, 2020, um, I would have like 30 days where I didn't drink and then I would drink and then I would have 30 more days where I didn't drink. And I think given the year that it was, we all drank more than we usually did. But I wasn't having these like massive benders. Um, and so... After he told me in September, I started, um, I was still, you know, working my butt off, but I was definitely drinking more and more kind of each month um, until the 3rd of November. And I uh, was making dinner for my family and I started pouring from a bottle of whiskey um, and I just didn't stop that night. We had uh, my partner's brother and um, girlfriend over uh, for dinner, and I was the drunkest idiot possible. And I said things, and 
that were not very nice and not very indicative of the person I am. Uh, and my, my heart was just hurting. And um, I, I realized I was having like a massive mental breakdown and I just couldn't, I couldn't shake it. Um, and so uh, that was a Friday night. A, a Saturday came, I think, I think it was a Friday night. A Saturday went through where I just slept through that Saturday. Like I couldn't get out of bed. I was super sick, obviously. But the bottle of whiskey that I had decided to go through was not a small one. And uh, so I was super sick and I was super depressed. And by, um, by that Sunday morning, I knew I was in trouble mentally. Um, and I made the decision with my partner that I needed to go into inpatient treatment for what I was experiencing. Um, and that's a hard decision. If you've never been in that situation of doing inpatient treatment for, for mental health specifically, um, it can be scary. It can be a scary situation to be in. And um, it's crisis management mostly, but you do see therapists and things. And um, despite the doctors kind of telling me that I had pushed myself too hard, that this, this the rate at which I had been uh, working and the responsibility, the amount of responsibility I had on my plate uh, was too much despite that, despite the doctors telling me that the relationship I was in was unhealthy, that there was mental and emotional abuse um, happening. It would, it would take me another full six months um, to officially leave him and to leave the hustle culture and mentality. And during that six months, I was in uh, therapy every week. And I was doing my best with tools to take care of my mental health. And I became a healthier person because of it. Um, so after six months of therapy, after six months away from alcohol, um, I was able to leave. I was able to leave him and the hustle culture mentality. Um, I think one more successfully than the other. I sometimes still really want to push myself really hard. I still sometimes want to pile on as much as I can into my schedule. Um, I still sometimes feel like I need to prove myself as worthy. Uh, I still sometimes want to use a busy schedule as a way to kind of like medicate what it is that's bothering me. Um, I would say over the last uh, year, I have learned uh, that pushing myself so hard, not only in the years previous, but just in general, um, had some heavy effects on my physical health. And uh, I'm just now to the point where that is mostly healed. You know, it's not, I'm able to walk. I wasn't not able to walk. Um, the end of last year. So it's May. I think I started walking successfully without a cane around February. I had completely worn down. And here's, here's what's interesting. I, I don't, again, I don't want to make this about anything other than conveying to you the importance of mental health and taking care of yourself. and But um, I had worn down a disc in my neck completely. Like, the thing was completely gone in a matter of a few years. On a spiritual level, to have something wrong with your spine, the very thing that holds structure to your entire being, having my spine give out on me, in my neck and in my lower back 
that pain that I was constantly feeling in 2018 and 2019 and 2020, all of that, to have had to have had shoulder surgery, you guys, my body was screaming and my body was screaming because my soul was screaming for change years before I ever felt like I just couldn't do it anymore. And isn't that interesting? Like, isn't that just so fucking intelligent on so many different levels? Isn't that proof that we are are more than just one body? We're more than just the physical body? That there are these other bodies that exist within us and around us and through us? It's pretty damn cool, you guys. So listen to it. (laughs) Um, I learned that in theory, hustle culture isn't bad. It has its place, however. And how you apply it, how you apply anything to your life matters. How conscious are you of what you are doing in your life? How present are you? It fucking matters, you guys. You cannot go hard in every area of your life and not burn out. This mentality mixed with a few other things broke me. It broke me. It sent me into the hospital. You can't constantly go hard and get adequate rest. You cannot give your everything to something or someone to the extreme and sustain fulfillment. It is not sustainable. And it absolutely does not guarantee love, acceptance, or security. I think the most important thing that my hustle culture journey has taught me is this, and it might be controversial and you might reject it, but I, uh, I encourage you to remember episode one where Chris and I talked about leaving it at the door if it doesn't resonate with you, but if it does trigger you, if it hits you wrong, I encourage you to look at what it is that's triggering you. Why are you triggered by that? Here's what I learned, you guys. Women are never meant to do it all alone, all by themselves. Women are strong. We are so strong, but we are not strong in that way. We are not strong in the way of being able to maintain our mental, emotional, and spiritual health while simultaneously carrying the world on our shoulders long term. We are crushing the divine, not only out of women, by the reach for more. You can have it all. Be a boss at work and a mom at home. Just don't mix the two mentality, but out of men, by not allowing them to step into their masculine and allowing them to take the weight off of our shoulders which would in turn bring a balance to the equation. But that, that's an entirely different episode, um, which I don't even know that I'll touch right now. We are diluting our existence down, you guys, to how much we can juggle without showing the world we are crumbling. We are posting it on social media and getting our dopamine hits from little red hearts that have no idea what is really going on in our private lives. And we are killing the divine feminine in the process. Anything that is forced into existence, forced into being, is stunted from its true potential into full manifestation. So if not hustle culture, then what do you do, right? The answer that I have found is alignment. 
we allow an endeavor alignment to take place. How? It's a good question. I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Um, Alignment is this gentle but dedicated practice of aligning your spirit, your intuition, and your heart space with the divine. It is a practice of slowing down, of connecting to your breath, of surrendering your timeline and all the details of your plan and being in a space of waiting and listening. And it's accepting help. It's action. Sometimes it's inaction. It is self-care. It is boundaries. It is rest. It is the opposite of working yourself into the ground to make something happen. It is a gentle grace and knowing that you are supported and loved by the divine, that the universe has you, and that you will not miss out on what is truly meant for you. You won't. You guys... We made it through this episode. (laughs) Um, Thank you for allowing me space to be vulnerable. This episode touches on a few different topics. It's a lot for one episode. Um, However, I felt that I needed to share it. So thank you. Uh, I hope that you found it at the very least intriguing. If you liked this episode, please feel free to subscribe to the Spiritual Bank Podcast. Uh, We are on social media. We have both an Instagram account and a Facebook account. Feel free to give us a like or a follow. Uh, Please feel free uh, to leave a review for us. We appreciate that. Um, Until next time, we hope you know that the universe loves you, that spirit loves you, and that we love you. Have a great week, you guys.